in Bandung back in, I think, 1954, was the first unity meeting in centuries of black people. And once you study what happened at the Bandung Conference and the results of the Bandung Conference, it actually serves as a model for the same procedure you and I can use to get our problem solved. At Bandung, all the nations came together. They were dark nations from Africa and Asia. Some of them were Buddhists. Some of them were Muslim. Some of them were Christian. Some of them were Confucian, Confucianists. Some were atheists. Despite their religious differences, they came together. Some were communists. Some were socialists. Some were capitalists. Despite, despite their economic and political differences, they came together. All of them were black, brown, red, or yellow. The number one thing that was not allowed to attend the Bandung Conference was the white man. He couldn't come. The Bandung Conference took place during a historic opening for colonized people. With imperial powers weakened by the Second World War, a space was cleared for independence movements to flourish and resist the growing threat of Cold War-induced instability. The meeting's legacy would inspire generations to come. The conference was attended by the many important anti-colonial figures of the time. Kwame Nkrumah, leader of soon-to-be independent Ghana, UNU, Prime Minister of Burma, Nehru, Prime Minister of India, Zhu Enlai, first premier of China, as well as the American Congressman Adam Clayton Powell Jr. and famed author Richard Wright and countless others. The era of the 50s with the era of the third world countries fighting colonialism and winning. Winning because their neighbors helped them. The case of Mozambique, the case of Angola, Guinea-Bissau, uh, the case of Zimbabwe, the case of the South Africa. When the African majority decided to fight racism and colonialism, they found that their neighbors, like Tanzania, for example, like Ghana, uh, like Egypt, like Guinea. These candidates did not have a lot to give, but whatever they had, they shared. And that was really an instrumental in training the first group of liberators, the first group of freedom fighters, to train and how to use the arms and then get them back to their countries, smuggle some guns across the borders, and get them to start the movement. And the liberation struggle, you have to know that time is on your side. The enemy is going to get tired eventually, and they have to give up. This happened and we know history speak of it today. Yeah man, we'll do it right, right now, you know what I say? Liberation style, grab love in other place. Yo, tomorrow, come in. Yeah, style. throw your fists up in the air, yeah, we right here. Rebel music in your area, Philly to Nigeria. Brooklyn to Haiti, Ghana to Liberia. What? We run things, a vision, our root wide superior. Boom, we on fire, you burn your one test, we chop your sound, you bow down, yes. respect me. Block that sound, my people are gonna get free. And we machete them like revolution in Haiti. Peace. The motherland music, Mau Mau Gorilla, heavyweight movement, peace, land, and leadership. Take back what they owe, that's what the mission is We build it, the God projects, the pyramids It's serious right now, you all know what time it is Stop killing ourselves and resurrect our villages yeah. I'm down for liberation, the question is who you running with Round here, the when ice talk, and how you running it Born it for the people, we feeding them by the hundreds Give them free breakfast and clinics just like the Panthers did yeah. Them not ready, liberation ain't no accident Let's get it in action, this is revolution Yo, happening I can't accept being loaded with lies, we gotta run the father of African nationalism, Nkrumah gave funds to other nationalist movements and preached the message across the continent. This mid-20th century is Africa's. This decade is the decade of African independence. Forward then to independence, to independence now. Tomorrow, the United States of Africa.
They also decided to try to help each other by providing foreign aid, especially China. I'll give you one example where um, the French decided to conduct a plebiscite in French-speaking Africa to decide whether they wanted to remain under the colonial rule for a while until they are ready to get independence or they want to get independence and break away from France. The only country that did that was Guinea under Secretary. And the French decided to punish him by stripping the country from everything that they could move, including doors, faucets, bulbs, chairs, tables, anything that they could move, they moved it out of the country. So when the French left, the country was stripped of all its financial resources or all its material possessions. At that time, African and Asian leaders, some of them were committed to uphold the independence of Guinea by shipping food, by airlifting equipment. They managed to get the country to stand on its own feet without the French. The French wanted to make a proof that the country like Guinea, with its limited financial resources, could survive without them. And they were absolutely wrong because Secretary managed to keep the country together under his leadership and became one of the most prominent leaders in Africa that fought colonialism and imperialism everywhere, wherever he could. South-South unity inherently threatened the interests of the West, which sought to maintain its dominance over land and labor. Despite the unity forged at Bandung, Western interests encroached on the newly independent countries. In concert with the former colonial powers, the U.S. intervened, undermining the self-determination of the young nations. For example, the U.S. backed sabotage missions by Chinese nationalists from Burma into communist China cooperated with the assassination of the democratically elected Patrice Lumumba in the Congo and backed the French reinvasion of Vietnam. Across the former colonized world, fragile stability was undermined by a series of coup d'etats, assassinations, and outright invasions. I believe that Africa would have been better off today if it was united under one government. Africa has a lot of resources. At that time, they did not have a larger population. They did not have uh, the many problems that they are encountering today, like HIV AIDS. So in fact, it would have been really a good time for African countries to unite and use their resources wisely and share it. Given that today throughout Asia poverty remains rampant and gaps in wealth grow and that the theft of Africa's wealth remains key to the hegemony of the West or that for African America the crisis of economic instability has been described as permanent, there remains much we can learn from the need for a Bandung then and similar unification now. As then President Sukarno of Indonesia exclaimed in 1955, we today also need unity and diversity. Oh, 
This is Dr. Muhammad Al Kawas at the University of the District of Columbia. For Black Agenda Radio, I'm Jared Ball. I'm Michael Hawk. And I'm Nefer Freeman. And this has been a commemoration of the Asian African Conference held in Bandung, Indonesia in 1955, also known as the Bandung Conference. <laughs> 